please turn your Bibles this afternoon in the first place to John chapter 6. I'm going to read first of all from John chapter 6, and then secondly from 1 Corinthians 11, in connection with Article 35 of our Confession, and what we confess concerning the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. John 6 doesn't speak directly to the Supper, but it does give us insight into the Supper as we learn that Jesus himself is the bread of life that has come down from heaven. And here in John 6, Jesus has just fed the 5,000. He has gained quite the following, but not necessarily for all the right reasons. For some have sought him only to get more bread from him. And so they've missed the point altogether. If you read John chapter 6, beginning at verse 35, whoever comes to holy word. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I say to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that is given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. And I will raise Him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about Him because He said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does He now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God, everyone who has heard and learned that the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that has come down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. But whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. Let's turn also to Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 11. Corinthians 11, where we'll begin reading at verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and, and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. 
For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. There ends the reading of God's holy word. May bless it to us as we meditate upon it this afternoon. Let's turn also in our forms and prayers books to Article 35 of our Confession. Article 35 can be found on page 193 in the Forms and Prayers books, 868, if you're using the back of the Psalter hymnal, 868 in the back of the hymnal. Article 35, the Sacrament of the Lord's Supper. We believe and confess that our Savior Jesus Christ has ordained and instituted the Sacrament of the Holy Supper to nourish and sustain those who are already born again and engrafted into his family, his church. Now, those who are born again have two lives in them. The one is physical and temporal. They have it from the moment of their first birth, and it is common to all. The other is spiritual and heavenly and is given them in their second birth. It comes through the word of the gospel and the communion of the body of Christ, and this life is common to God's elect only. Thus, to support the physical and earthly life, God has prescribed for us an appropriate earthly and material bread, which is common to all as life itself also is. But to maintain the spiritual and heavenly life that belongs to believers, he has sent a living bread that came down from heaven, namely Jesus Christ, who nourishes and maintains the spiritual life of believers when eaten, that is, when appropriated and received spiritually by faith. To represent to us this spiritual and heavenly bread, Christ has instituted an earthly and visible bread as a sacrament of his body and the wine as a sacrament of his blood. He did this to testify to us that just as truly as we take and hold the sacraments in our hands and eat and drink it in our mouths by which our life is then sustained, so truly we receive into our souls for our spiritual good the true body and true blood of Christ, our only Savior. We receive these by faith, which is the hand and mouth of our souls. Now, it is certain that Jesus Christ did not prescribe his sacraments for us in vain, since he works in us all he represents by these holy signs, although the manner in which he does it goes beyond our understanding and is incomprehensible to us, just as the operation of God's Spirit is hidden and incomprehensible. And yet we do not go wrong when we say that what is eaten is Christ's own natural body and what is drunk is his own blood. But the manner in which we eat it is not by the mouth, but by the Spirit through faith. In that way, Jesus Christ remains always seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. But he never refrains on that account to communicate himself to us through faith. This banquet is a spiritual table at which Christ communicates himself to us with all his benefits. At the table, he makes us enjoy himself as much as the merits of his suffering and death, as he nourishes, strengthens, and comforts our poor, desolate souls by the eating of his flesh and relieves and renews them by the drinking of his blood. Moreover, through the sacraments and the thing, though the sacraments and the things signified are joined together, not all receive both of them. The wicked person certainly takes the sacrament, but to his condemnation, and does not receive the truth of the sacrament, just as Judas and Simon the sorcerer both indeed received the sacrament, but not Christ, who is signified by it. He, that is Christ, is communicated only to believers. Finally, 
With humility and reverence, we receive the holy sacrament in the gathering of God's people. As we engage together with thanksgiving in a holy remembrance of the death of Christ our Savior, and as we thus confess our faith in Christian religion. Therefore, no one should come to this table without examining himself carefully, lest by eating this bread and drinking this cup he eat and drink to his own judgment. In short, by the use of this holy sacrament, we are moved to a fervent love of God and our neighbors. Therefore, we reject as desecrations of the sacraments all the muddled ideas and damnable inventions that men have added and mixed in with them. And we say that we should be content with the procedure that Christ and the apostles have taught us and speak of these things as they have spoken of them. This the church of Christ does confess and believe throughout the world. Dear congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the 42nd chapter of his prophecy, Isaiah compared believers like you and me to bruised reeds and faintly burning wicks. And this, of course, was the prophet's way of acknowledging that God's people are not so strong when left to themselves and to their own devices. The spiritual lives of God's people are often marked by by ups and downs. Their lives are often marked by, by taking one step forward and then two steps back because sin and temptation often get the best of them. As Lord's Day 44 tells us, even the, the holiest of believers have but a, a small beginning of Christian obedience. And as Lord's Day 52 reminds us, even the strongest of believers are so weak that they cannot stand on their own even for a moment. And so Isaiah says that we are like bruised reeds and faintly burning wicks, neither of which are hard to picture in our minds. Even the strongest reed in the field is incredibly weak. Any child can come along and snap it in half. We've all seen a candle that's just about to go out where only a small ember remains. And these are the word pictures that Isaiah uses to describe believers like you and me. They're not very flattering word pictures, are they? Bruised reeds and faintly burning wigs. But the comfort of that passage, of course, lies in the reality that that Jesus knows these things about us, doesn't he? Jesus is pleased to show the riches of his grace and mercy toward us. He has compassion on us. Jesus surely knows that we are like bruised reeds and faintly burning wicks. He knows that likely some of us are are here this afternoon, and we feel as though we're just barely hanging on by a thread. He knows that some of you have been struggling against various sins in your life, and you feel as though you're losing the battle. Perhaps despair has begun to sink into your heart, and Jesus knows that too. But because Jesus is a gentle Savior, he does not snap us in two. Because he's a gentle and kind Savior, he doesn't snuff us out. Rather, he supports us and strengthens us. In the midst of our doubt and, and despair, he, he reignites that, that flickering fame of our, fl- of our faith, and he sustains us. This congregation is what Jesus is telling us about himself in the Holy Supper. As we've been considering the last couple of weeks now, the sacraments are not so much about what we are saying to God as they are about what God is saying to us. The sacraments are, are Christ's She's a word testimony to us and not the other way around. And just as Jesus reveals himself to us in his word, so he also, to all, he also reveals himself in the sacraments. As our confession so wonderfully puts it, this banquet is a spiritual table at which Christ communicates himself to us and all his benefits. At the table, he makes us enjoy himself. As much as the merits of his suffering and death, as he nourishes, strengthens, comforts, and uh, supports our poor, desolate souls by the eating of his flesh, and as he relieves and renews them by the drinking of his blood. Jesus is the one who is speaking in the supper. He's the one revealing himself to us in the supper. And so this gift of the Holy Supper we see is yet another way in which the Lord Jesus continues to to care for his church here on the earth. Here in the supper, he 
strengthens our poor and desolate souls, nor that we might love him more dearly and serve him more fervently in the joy of our salvation. And so as we consider this rather lengthy article together this afternoon, I'd like for us to consider three things together. In the first place, we want to see Christ's renewing purpose in the supper. And then secondly, we want to see his real presence in the supper. And then finally, we want to consider the reverential partakers at the supper. We note in the first place, Christ's renewing purpose. Why has the Lord Jesus ordained this sacrament? To what end did our Savior break bread with his disciples on that night when he was betrayed? And we find the answer at the very start of this article. We believe and confess that our Savior Jesus Christ has ordained and instituted this sacrament of the supper to nourish and sustain those who are already born again and engrafted into his family, the church. In his condescending grace, in his covenant mercy, the Lord Jesus stoops to our weakness. He condescends to us from the heights of heaven to meet us where we are. Being mindful of our weakness and our frailty, he's, he's given us a sacrament as he's given us baptism to, to seal his promises within us, to, to pledge his good will and grace toward us, to strengthen and, and nourish our faith as we confess in Article 33. And by giving us the Lord's Supper, Jesus shows us that he knows us even better than we know ourselves. He knows that if left to ourselves, we are weak and wobbly. He knows that we are like bruised reeds shaking in the wind. He knows that the burden of our sins often weighs down on us so heavily that sometimes we begin to, to wander in our hearts. Well, is my faith really sincere? Is it really real? If I continue to suffer and struggle against sins in this way, but in order to support us in our weakness, in order to renew us in our assurance, he gave the supper in order that we might eat and drink in remembrance of him. The gospel, you see, is for weaklings, and so is his table. As the preparatory form for the Lord's Supper reminds us, even though we do not have perfect faith and do not serve and love God with all our hearts, and even though we do not love our neighbors as we ought, we can be confident that the Savior accepts us at his table when we come in humble faith with sorrow for our sins and with the will to follow him as he commands. Therefore, the form says we must not allow the weakness of our faith or our failures in the Christian life to keep us from the table. For it has been given because of our weakness and because of our failures in order to increase our faith by feeding us with the body and blood of Christ. It's to the weak and the wobbly that Jesus says, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you. For as our confession says, those who are born again have two lives in them, the one physical and temporal and the other spiritual and heavenly. And to support our physical and earthly life, the confession reminds us God has prescribed for us a material and, and earthly bread. But to maintain our spiritual and heavenly life, which belongs to believers, he sent a living bread down from heaven, namely Jesus Christ, who nourishes and maintains our, our spiritual life so that when we eat of him, or that, we, that he does that as we eat of him, when we appropriate and receive all his spiritual benefits. And this is what Christ is seeking to press home in, in this sermon he's delivering here in John chapter 6. All these followers have, have gathered around him in pursuit of more physical bread, and Jesus rebukes them, saying, you're, you're missing the point. More than mere physical bread, you need spiritual bread. You need the bread that has, that has come down from heaven. That bread of which you may eat of it and, and not die. Christ is saying, you don't need physical bread, you, you need me. And that's what he was trying to press home when he said, I'm the living bread that has come down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give him for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus was pressing home for them that they needed him. They needed the sacrifice that he was going to offer, and that's reflected in verses 53 and following. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of God and drink his blood, you have no life in you. 
But whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in you. It was graphic language for sure. As the fall, uh, these followers were go on to say at the end of the chapter, this was a, a hard saying that few were able to accept. But by speaking of his body in this way, Jesus was speaking with a view to the sacrifice that he was going to provide on the cross. That sacrifice which we must have a share in if we are to be recipients of eternal life. that we might be renewed in the wonder of that promise of eternal life, Christ gave the sacrament. As our confession says, to represent to us the spiritual and heavenly bread, which are references to his person and work, Christ instituted an earthly and visible bread as a sacrament of his body and wine as a sacrament of his blood. He did this to testify to us that as truly as we take and hold the sacraments in our hands and eat and drink it in our mouths, by which our physical life is sustained so truly, we receive into our souls for our spiritual life the true body and blood of Christ, our only Savior. We receive these by faith, which is the hand and mouth of our souls. As we read in Psalm 65, God in His grace not only looks after all our physical needs, but more importantly, He looks after all of our spiritual needs as well. He reminds us that he is concerned for our spiritual vitality, for our spiritual nourishment to sustain us in that new birth of regeneration. Just as Isaiah says, just as a mother does not forget the nursing child at her breast, nor does the father forget those whom he has caused to be born again by the Spirit. But he sustains them, he nourishes them, he supports them. This is what the sacraments that the Lord has given us serve to show us. Baptism, as we heard last Sunday, is about initiation and incorporation into the church, which is why it's, it's received but once. But the Lord's Supper is different in that way, as Christ has commanded a frequent celebration of it to remind us of our frequent need to be strengthened by Him and nourished by Him. In His grace, Jesus provides this strengthening already in the preaching of the word. That's what he does for us each Lord's Day. But being mindful of our weakness, he also appeals to our other external senses. He uses the bread and the wine that we might be all the more assured of his goodness and grace toward us. As one theologian once put it, you don't get a better Christ in the Lord's Supper, but sometimes you may get Christ better in the Supper as he appeals to your external senses. This is his renewing purpose in the supper. And in connection with that, the second thing that we want to consider together is Christ's real presence. Christ accomplishes this renewing purpose through his real presence. And this, of course, is one of the most heated debates at the time of of the Reformation, this whole question of whether or not Christ was actually present in the supper. Now, as you may know, there were three other prominent views at that time. Of course, you first of all had the the Roman Catholic view, which said that when the the priest consecrated the bread and the wine, those elements were actually transformed into Christ's physical body and blood, so that those elements themselves were to be venerated and and worshipped. Well, in contrast to that, you had the Lutherans who said, no, that can't be, that's idolatry. It's not that the elements are changed into the body and blood of Christ, But they said that Christ's body and blood are somehow in, with, and under the elements. And that was grounded in their ubiquitous view of Christ's new body. So that Christ could have a physical body up in heaven, but somehow be around the elements here on earth. And of course, the main problem with that view is that if that's the case, then we don't have the advocate that we need to have in heaven. If if Christ's body can be everywhere, then we don't have our own real flesh and blood in heaven. Well, in contrast to both of those things, you then have the view of of Zwingli, who said that Christ isn't present at all. In contrast to Rome, in contrast to Luther, Zwingli said this Lord's Supper is just a memorial, nothing more, nothing less. It's just a remembrance. Christ isn't there at all. Let 
And so Zwingli argued for a very infrequent celebration, lest we fall back into the snare of the Roman Catholic Church. But with Calvin and our confession came the more biblical and nuanced position, affirming that although Christ is not physically present in the supper, he is spiritually present in the supper. And the Lord's Supper, our communion, is not just with one another, but it's with the Lord Jesus himself. As our confession says, it is certain that Christ did not prescribe his sacraments for us in vain. Since he truly works in us all that he represents to us by these holy signs, And in virtue of that reality, we confess that we do not go wrong when we say that what is eaten is Christ's own natural body and what is drunk is his own blood. But the manner in which we eat is not by the mouth, but by the Spirit through faith. In that way, Jesus Christ remains seated in heaven as our advocate at the right hand of the Father. And at the same time, by his Spirit, he never refrains to communicate himself to us through faith. This banquet is a spiritual table at which Christ communicates himself to us with all his benefits. He makes us enjoy himself. He nourishes and strengthens and comforts our poor, desolate souls. He relieves and renews us as we eat the bread and drink from the cup. Christ is spiritually there. He is spiritually present in the Lord's Supper. A lot of these things are beyond our our ability to comprehend, this is what the Bible teaches. That as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, the cup of blessing that we bless is indeed a participation in the blood of Christ, and the bread that we break is indeed a participation in the body of Christ. And so when we come to the table in faith, we can be sure that Christ by His Spirit is is sitting there at the head of the table as, as the host of that table, as the host of that supper. Our communion is with him in virtue of the mystical union that we have with him in his death and resurrection. Christ is present in the supper. Lamentably, although Calvin's view won the day in the Reformed churches, Wingley's practice seemed to have won the day. As most churches celebrate rather infrequently under the same guise and fears that Zwingli perhaps had. But Christ is present in the supper, just as he's present in the preaching and the worship service. And so, lest we should be tempted, though, to think that these spiritual benefits are received and appropriated merely through the physical act of eating and drinking, that is, without faith, our confession does well to remind us that although the sacraments and the, 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 sacraments and the things signified are joined together, not all receive them both, and this brings us to our last consideration, namely Christ's reverential partakers. The spiritual blessings and benefits, our confession says, are only communicated to believers. To be sure, the wicked person may partake, he may eat and drink, but he does so to his own condemnation as it was with Judas and with Simon the sorcerer. And so the confession teaches us, finally, with humility and reverence, we ought to receive the Holy Sacrament and the gathering of God's people as we engage together with thanksgiving in a holy remembrance of the death of Christ our Savior, and as we thus confess our faith in Christian religion. Therefore, no one should come to this table without examining himself carefully, lest by eating this bread and drinking this cup, he eat and drink to his own judgment. The failure to do this very thing was, of course, the great problem in Corinth at the time of Paul's writing the Corinthians. You see, we're abusing the table. Paul says there were divisions among them, and there were some who were coming to the table simply because they were hungry and not because they were seeking communion with Christ. As Charles Hodge writes, they were coming to the Lord's table in a careless and irreverent spirit without the intention or desire to commemorate the death of Christ as the sacrifice for our sins. And so some were falling ill and some, we read, had even died. And so Paul wrote to them in his letter, in order that he might remind them of why exactly the supper was given to us in the first place. He backs up to the night when the sacrament was instituted, and he said it was given to be a holy remembrance of Christ's death until he comes. 
And so he said, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. And while these words aren't written to make us feel afraid of coming to the table, they are written to make us examine our faith to see that we really are trusting in the Lord Jesus. The call to self-examination, this call to partake in a, in a worthy manner is not to see if, if we are worthy, but to partake in a worthy manner is to see that our faith is sincere. All who are sorry for their sins and sincerely believe in Christ as their Savior and earnestly desire to lead a godly life, says the form for the Lord's Supper, ought to come and accept the invitation given them and come to the table in gladness. In other words, to come to the table in a worthy manner is to come in humility. It's to come confessing to God that we are but bruised reeds and faintly burning wicks. We need to be strengthened by him and supported and nourished by him. And so writes Hodge, there is nothing in these passages which should, which should surround the Lord's table with gloom. For we are not called unto the mount covered with clouds and darkness, from which issue the signs of wrath, writes Hodge, but we are called unto Mount Zion, to the abode of mercy and grace, where all is love, the dying love of him who never breaks the bruised reed. Christ would have us to be assured of that this afternoon, that the sacrament is given to us by a Savior who is mindful of our weakness, who is mindful of our frailty. It's given to us by a Savior who, who knows our frame, who knows our doubts and our despair, but who does not break us or snuff us out. He bids us to come to him for his healing mercies. As he said in John 6, he bids us to come to him one and all with the promise that whoever comes to him, he will never cast out. This, our confession shows us, is our kind and gentle Savior. As often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And the supper is a seal of that, too, that Christ is, is coming. He's coming again to take us to be where he is, to, to sit at that new table in the presence of all our enemies where our cup overflows. And so we long for that day. He's saying, even so, come, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we we come before you again and we give you thanks that in your grace and mercy you speak to us. You stoop to our weakness, mighty as you are, and you reveal yourself to us. We thank you, Lord, that, the, Lord, that being mindful of our weaknesses, you've given to the church not only the preaching of the word, but also the sacraments, whereby Christ might appeal to our external senses in order that we might be assured of his goodness and grace toward us. In this manner, Lord, we thank you for the table. We thank you for the Lord's Supper, where we have communion with the Lord Jesus Christ, where we partake of him and all his blessings and benefits. And Father, we long to be seated at the heavenly table. We long, Lord, to be where Christ is, to be servants at his table. But until that day comes, Lord, may we proclaim his death and resurrection to this world. That more and more also may find a seat at the same table and find peace and rest in him. This we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.